Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Harpreet Singh. I'm a first year at Harvard College and a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors which are located on both the park side over here and the JFK street side over there. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag JFK Junior Forum Live, which is also listed in your program. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming tonight's guests, Susan Crawford, Depine Ghosh, Laura Manley, Tom Wheeler, and tonight's moderator, Short Steeny Center Director, Nico Miley. Welcome, folks. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce our panel and then uh, tell you why I think we're here. <coughs> so my name is Nico Mealy. I'm director of the Shorenstein Center here at the Kennedy School. We have Susan Crawford, the uh, a professor from Harvard Law School, former commissioner of the uh, <coughs> former, no, former special assistant, special assistant uh, to the president of the United States on technology and science policy. She's the author of this exceptional recent book. Just came out, Fiber, The Coming Revolution and Why America Might Miss It. I recommend it to you. I'm going to briefly read to you its chapters, including education in fiber, health in fiber, inequality in fiber, lessons from American communities, why American internet access is awful. <laughs> Next to her is uh, one of our fellows from the Shorenstein Center, Tom Wheeler. Tom Wheeler was the uh, chairman of the Federal Election Commission, uh, Federal Election Commission, there we go. <laughs> the Federal Communications Commission. Arguably they ought to be the same thing. Uh, Federal Communications uh, Commission uh, in the latter half of the Obama administration. Laura Manley is uh, director of the Technology and Public Purpose uh, program here at the Belfer Center. She is the inaugural director of that program. And Dupayan Ghosh is uh, another Shorenstein Fellow and uh, comes to us uh, first immediately prior to the Shorenstein from Facebook and prior to that from the White House and the Obama administration. We have a, a compelling and robust range of views. Looking forward to an exciting discussion. Oh, and I was wondering, this is Tom's new book, From Gutenberg to Google, The History of Our Future a very compelling book about the role of technology, communications technology, and what's happened, uh, how it shaped the country. Uh, it's, it has everything from the original information revolution to the planet's most powerful and pervasive platform. And we are here today, so these two books, I highly recommend them. Thank you. I will not give you these copies because they're signed, but you can go buy one. Please do. Or two um, or three. Or two or three. And so we're here tonight because uh, if anyone who's been paying attention to the news for the last year or so uh, has woken up to the power of digital platforms and large technology <laughs> providers to shape our politics and even our public policy. And, you know, uh, we had uh, representatives from many of the major social network companies testify in front of Congress. <laughs> There appeared to be a disconnect from the way Congress <laughs> understood what was happening to how these uh, CEOs and other C-suite leaders understood what was happening. But one of the challenges is uh, uh, if you ask, like watching the congressional testimony, if you ask different members of Congress to articulate the problem, or you ask uh, different, different, maybe even the people on this panel to articulate the problem, you get a wide range of views. So I wanted to start by asking Susan, why, why do we care about big <coughs> tech companies, about the power that they have? I'm going to turn this question a little bit upside down and say that focusing on these enormous platform problems forces us to confront uh, what's wrong with living in, in America right now, because something is profoundly wrong, and it's wrong in a host of interconnected ways. So just uh, three stories, and I'll focus on Amazon because that's entertaining. Um, 
Think about, for example, that Amazon Web Services, a hyperscale cloud provider, is actually a, its own private internet across the United States, not relying on our own not-too-great system, and able to reach very close into cities connected just a hop away from customers. Why do they do this? To avoid our not-very-great system, to really hack around it and essentially privatize access because Amazon and Microsoft and Google have so much power in that market, anybody wanting to launch a new service has to agree to their terms of service, essentially, and make sure that their packets you know, match the rules that uh, these three companies have set up. That's interesting. So I'll start there. That's story number one. Story number two, Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway and <coughs> J.P. Morgan Chase are starting their own healthcare system for their 1.1 million employees. Because why? They want to build around the not so great healthcare system in the United States and make sure that their employees do well. Story number three, at the same time that the New York City subway system is falling apart, the public authorities in New York State and the city agreed with Amazon to make sure that the company could build a helipad. Why? So that they could avoid public transit. You know, uh, the philosopher Elizabeth Stevenson at uh, Michigan has pointed out that when you talk about equality and inequality in America, you really should focus on what basic services everybody needs in order to lead a thriving life. What do you need to get respect in your life to live in the 21st century? With respect to all three systems, healthcare, transit, communications, all of these things are essential for Americans, but these giant companies can build around them. At the same time that China, let's just put this on the table, is able to build high-speed rail very quickly, <coughs> make sure that everybody has great communications, fabulous fiber to 80% of Chinese homes, and uh, the Belt Road Initiative will reach 65% of the world's population. We don't seem to have an answer to that. All we have, we don't actually have a choice between a thriving private market on the one hand and government control on the other. There's actually a private government, privatized functions of government that are provided to a few people by these giant providers. So I, I want to use this conversation to focus on what we're not doing as a country rather than what we should be doing to beat up on these particular and uh, uh, you're really talking about almost like the privatization of public policy. Yeah. And I'm reminded that, like, I think it was last week, The Verge published this long uh, investigation of Amazon's uh, sellers program. The, um, oh, right? yeah. uh, there are about six million businesses selling merchandise through Amazon, mm -hmm. about $200 billion a year revenue for those businesses. And there is a whole, like, shadow almost like a legal system mm -hmm. for, for dealing with disputes right. over, over uh, if Amazon bans a product or bans a seller or there's you know, co uh, two sellers going to war over pricing. Right. It was a crazy article about this, in addition to public policy, even like a shadow judicial process right. that's developing. Um, Tom, I'm going to turn to you now. Susan says uh, that the problem is these large companies are in a sense almost privatizing big parts of public policy in part because uh, as a nation we haven't invested in some of the key infrastructure and addressed some of the challenges that the technology presents. And I wonder from your perspective, um, you know, do you do you agree? But also, when you're thinking about how we have to approach these questions, what are some of the what are some of the values or ideas we have to keep in mind? What are some of the root challenges involved in this sector? Well, let me pick up on something that both you and Susan uh, have said. First of all, um, you quoted from my book, so I want to quote that again. Okay, um, the internet and our digital capacity to communicate has become the most powerful and pervasive platform in the history of the planet. Now that kind of underpins a bunch of the concerns that Susan had raised. And that platform, that incredibly powerful platform Susan points out uh, a private platform uh, in most instances 
Um, those who build and manage and then deliver on that platform make their own rules. And they're making their rules like human nature would have you do it in their best interests. So the question becomes, if you have this underlying infrastructure that is essential to the operation of the 21st century, should the public be represented in the rules of its operation? And I clearly think the answer is yes. And that, that what we have been doing thus far is burying our head in our inability to understand technology or our unwillingness to come to grips with technology. Um, and, uh, and, therefore, and saying, well, therefore, we'll let this all take care of itself because, you know, if we touch this, we just may break the magic. Well, it's time to touch it. It's time to step up and say, what are the functions of this powerful platform that need to be structured to think about the interests of the people? And I think there are two basic concepts that we need to have, whether you're an Amazon, a Netflix, a Facebook who rides on the platform, or you are, or he rides on the network, or you are the network itself. One is um, a duty to deal. This is what net neutrality was all about. I'm leaving here right after this to go down tomorrow and testify because now that we have a democratic house, once again, the appropriate question is being asked about why aren't our networks open? Since the Pacific Telegraph Act in 1860, our networks have been open until we got to this network. The, there is a, and that is a concept that really isn't an 1860 concept. It is a concept that goes back to English common law. That, that the guy who ran the ferry across the river couldn't discriminate as to who got on that ferry. There was a duty to deal. Then there's the next step that we have to have an expectation about, and that is that those who provide us services have to have a duty of care to make sure that the impact of the products and services that they are offering to us um, are not harmful, and beyond not harmful, that they mitigate any potential for harm. This again is something that goes back 600 years to English common law. And so one of the things that we're working about, at, uh, working on at the Shorenstein Center, uh, Depayan and, and Gene Kimmelman and Phil Verveer uh, and I, is just exactly this question, which is how do we establish essential principles that everything else then flows from so that this most powerful platform in the history of the planet is in fact managed for the benefit of the people who use it, not just the people who build it. And so duty to <clears throat> deal then is about requiring companies in the space to uh, to be more open, to allow their platforms to be used by competitors, by others in other kinds of ways. And there's a duty to deal that applies over on the other side to all those folks who are siphoning off all of our information and hoarding it and using that hoard to establish their new monopoly position in the marketplace of, uh, of digital information as the, as the asset of the 21st century. Um, Laura, when you are talking to policymakers and looking at the space, 
What do you think policymakers need to understand? What do they, what, how, how do they navigate? What are the challenges of navigating this space as a policymaker? So just to sort of set the context and reiterate some of the things that Tom and Susan said, the complexity, the pervasiveness, <coughs> and the speed of these new technologies coming onto market is unprecedented. At the same time, our governing institutions have not adapted as quickly. So what do we wind up with? We wind up with the Google CEO being asked about an iPhone. We wind up with Mark Zuckerberg having to explain the business models of social media companies. So what does the actual landscape of science and technology capacity for Congress specifically look like? So at the member level, in the 115th Congress, there were only three scientists with formal technical training. At the staff level, with over 3,500 legislative staff, it's estimated that less than 1% have formal technical training. On top of that, we have Google, Amazon, and Facebook spending $48 million in lobbying efforts in 2017, and that number is consistently going up every year. So one of the things that the TAP project is looking to explore is how do you build capacity and expertise for members of Congress and their staff so that they can start to make more informed decisions on these science and technology related issues. So we've uncovered a couple things. First, there are technical fellowships, so AAAS fellowships, Tech Congress, they do a great job <coughs> of placing technical experts in the actual member's office. The next thing, congressional and member trainings. These are fantastic opportunities to bring the members and their staff up to speed. In fact, we're partnering with the Shorenstein Center to do one on digital platform accountability later in this month. The next thing are developing materials, not only that are timeless and time timely and comprehensive, but are digestible. Most members and their, their staff don't have time to read these long white papers, and even though they might be technically correct, we really need to be able to react more quickly. The last thing is the, the idea of building a new body to do technology assessment. So we have a history of this. The Office of Technology Assessment did exist and was defunded in 1994 to provide Congress with unbiased technology assessment. There are lots of different options for doing that. We recently had conversations with the Government Accountability Office on, on their efforts to do technology assessment in their office. So that's another venue for potentially increasing science and technology capacity for members of Congress. So all of these are different options. Not one will do the job. So it's going to take a multi-pronged effort to figure out how, how Congress, how the government more generally can start reacting more effectively and, and more quickly to the demands of these technologies. Hmm. So, uh, you know, Susan, you say that the, these companies are so big and due to basically an underinvestment in the United States in, in infrastructure, right. they're building their own infrastructures, right? Right. And I worry sometimes you're like kids on a soccer field that are all scrumming around beating up on these companies when actually we've got some profound structural issues where we should be directing this kind of technical acumen and this kind of leadership. And we don't seem to be addressing this. We just keep talking about accountability for different kinds of speech. I, I actually am not gonna care about speech yeah, on the platforms. There are private platforms. We need more of them. That would be great. More abundance of bandwidth, more different kinds of services. That would be terrific. But as it stands now, we're fighting over a relatively scarce and not well-funded uh, set of infrastructure in a host of areas. And we're, we're, our attention has been distracted by focusing so much on Facebook and Google. And, um, you know, Tom, in some sense, you're saying that what we need is uh, is to think about the responsibilities or duties of these companies to the country and to public policy, right? And, and to individuals as well. So, so if you go back through history, the, uh, those who pioneer new territory make the rules for that territory until those rules begin to impinge on the rights of everyone else. My argument is we are at that crossover. We've crossed that point, okay? And then when the debate becomes, what should those rules be? There is a list of N plus one solutions. But the real question is, how do those specific solutions 
fit into overarching eternal principles that have worked over the last 600 years to get us to this point. And, and Susan, you would, in, in your frame, you're right. saying that the solutions are, have in some sense, nothing to do with these companies, but right. to do with the larger public policy issues. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But right. some of these core values Tom is talking about would still apply. They would right? just go down a level and not be so involved in content. Because I agree, mm -hmm. this is really hard to sort of create a federal computer commission that's going to worry about how particular things are treated. And we could spend a lot of energy on this and miss China. And that, that would be a mistake, I think. Well, worse yeah. than that, if I just yeah. say, oh, worse, worse than that. Worse than that. The defense that we are now going to hear from the big companies is, oh, the only way you beat China is to let us bulk up and abuse the market even more. Okay? Mm -hmm. We're already seeing that in the T-Mobile Sprint merger, mm. right? Where the whole strategy there is saying, we'll lose the 5G race to China unless you allow us to merge and reduce competition so that we'll be able to pour more money into, uh, uh, into 5G. And, and that is a false choice. We cannot allow ourselves to become distracted by the China scare to do things that are not in our own interest. You can do both. And Laura, I think you're saying that, <clears throat> the, that both the actual talent in the government, uh, both the, I would assume all three branches, as well as in some sense the process, the legislative and regulatory process, are really ill-suited to the pace and intensity of the technology. Yeah, I, I would boil it down to two things members and their staff even knowing if they don't know or knowing when to ask. And then if they do know to ask, where do you go to get unbiased, comprehensive, timely information? About emerging technologies or the challenges of the industry. Yeah. And that the, the easiest place to go is the lobbyist industry has yes. staffed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we go to Depion, and uh, Depion, there are actually a number of bills in Congress right now proposing different solutions. You know, a lot of the solutions, I think, may have some of Tom's values that what Tom articulated in them in some way, shape, or form, but, but don't speak to the kind of systemic rot that Susan is talking about. Uh, but when you look at what's out there in terms of policy solutions, what, what seems most compelling to you that is currently on the table and what might be missing? It's a well, small question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I, I want to first just mention that this is a tremendously complicated space. We are dealing with an industry that, uh, and an <coughs> internet sector, as Tom mentioned, that has really just taken over the world uh, on a... On a just an exponential, uh, exponential level. And I just want to share a couple of things that have r recent industry moves that have happened that have not really picked up all that much uh, in terms of uh, public scrutiny, but which really illustrate how, uh, how impactful these industry moves might be for the, the functioning of our democracy. Um, so the first, you mentioned, you mentioned China. Uh, Apple, um, Tim Cook is, uh, is out uh, you know, on stage all the time and talking about how uh, we don't collect anybody's data and this differentiates Apple from Facebook uh, or from Google and uh, this is, this is we're, we're doing tremendous things for our consumers. We care about your rights. But it's not as though Apple just, uh, just follows all natural human rights values consistently through all its business practices. Um, and as a matter of fact, just a year and a half ago, uh, China decided to issue a, a data protection regulation that requires all internet companies that want to collect information on Chinese citizens to localize their data centers in China. And very quietly, just a few weeks later, uh, Apple announced <coughs> through a press release, a very quiet one, that, that it was installing uh, a new data center in China to comply with the Chinese law, which would give the Chinese government access to, uh, to security reviews of any information uh, flowing over Apple's network. Another incident, 
Uh, just just uh, uh, last year, we heard about the Cambridge Analytica incident. But uh, what, what wasn't really uh, included in all the revelations, at least in a, in a very public way, was that the real, uh, really difficult thing about the revelations, really difficult <coughs> thing about the Alexander Kogan data dump that he gave to Cambridge Analytica, which was engaged by the Trump campaign, was that Cambridge Analytica most likely had possession of Facebook user IDs. And it's with those 87 million Facebook user IDs, most of those 87 million people being American voters, that you were able to target in a very precise way specific audiences on Facebook with your disinformation or with, uh, with any, any type of political content, even at that stage, that you, that you might want to target specific audiences with. Uh, another incident just a, just a couple of days ago was that Facebook decided to uh, amalgamate all its internet-based text messaging services, Messenger, WhatsApp, and Instagram. Um, and I'd argue that this, this implicates competition on the <coughs> internet broadly. Why do I mention these things? It's because each of these is a deeply significant move for the sector and speaks to the ability for Russian disinformation operators and for the propagators of hate speech and people trying to push uh, discriminatory content on the, uh, over, over these large networks, each of these moves enables all of these bad practices that we, we care so much about in this country and, and care so much about protecting American consumers against. And yet, the public doesn't really have a good sense of the fact that these things are happening and the fact that the industry is able to do these things on, a, on an almost unilateral basis. <coughs> and it all goes back to what Tom was saying earlier, which is that uh, there is a lack of a regulatory regime that applies to this sector because of how new it is and because of how effectively it has, uh, it has uh, lobbied Congress and, and, and jurisdictions around the world. So going back, Nico, to, to what you ask, I think the policy solutions going forward have to be broad enough to really apply a new regulatory regime for internet companies that can solve for all these issues at the same time. Because if we are not able to uh, develop a regime that, that really <coughs> Uh, does that in, in an effective way, uh, we're, we're going to see, uh, it's, it's going to be a whack-a-mole game going forward. And so I would look at the business model that's Im implicit to the internet sector, which is really focused on three things. Uh, it's focused on the creation of tremendously compelling services that are borderline addictive, as some psychologists argue, and which are uh, really limiting competition over the internet. Uh, the collection of data over those services on an uninhibited basis uh, to develop behavioral advertising profiles on individuals, and uh, the, uh, the creation of algorithms that curate content and target ads uh, in, a, in a very opaque way. We don't really have any information about how these algorithms are, are designed or operated by companies like Facebook or Google. And so what I'd argue for is a policy regime that treats those three areas in the way that really protects the American consumer. Uh, that is to say, we need a new way of thinking about these tremendously compelling services by applying a new competition policy framework against big tech. Uh, we need a new privacy regime that really responds to this uninhibited way that companies are able to collect information on individuals. And we need a new <coughs> transparency regime that enables consumers to understand what companies have on them and, and how they are using information, uh, information on them uh, in potentially uh, democracy implicating ways. Uh, so I think there are some proposals. Uh, we've seen, for example, in transparency, a tremendously good, in terms of a first step, bill from Mark Warner, Amy Klobuchar, and the late John McCain uh, called the Honest Ads Act to push transparency. Um, that is, that is uh, very frustratingly being lobbied against heavily by some of the companies that, that Tom mentioned. Uh, we've, we've seen a number of privacy bills come forward um, from, from various, uh, various senators and from various uh, companies and uh, industry organizations. Um, 
And, and we've also seen new discussions around competition policy, specifically also on, on antitrust. Uh, and I think we have to really consider all of these frameworks and, and start to sketch out a policy regime, a regulatory regime that can really treat all of these business practices that are implicating American democracy. I'll let Susan and then Tom weigh in. <laughs> so, um, uh, from my decades in the warm pond that is Washington telecommunications land, I, wa <laughs> I want to actually at this point align myself with the head of the antitrust division at the Department of Justice right now, who has said that clever lawyers can work around any set of rules you put in place in words. And it's true. Behavioral limitations on these companies that are not aligned with their profit interests aren't going to work. We know that. And so I'm very glad that Mr. Ghosh has raised the idea of... Dr. Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh, <laughs> sorry. Of uh, competition policy, because what we're going to see, what we're going to need, is actually forcing these companies to choose a hat. You're either the marketplace or you're selling things in the marketplace. You're either the place that's open to, for people to post content or you're making decisions about that content and making partnerships with people. That's the only way we're going to have any effect on these data uses. And uh, to the extent that's the goal of this policy, I, I can see where that would make sense. What I worry about is that we spend endless hours crafting words that then are easily lawyered around or computed around. And that was the value of the open internet order. Right. But um, In some ways. In mo most Ma ways. Many ways. Okay. By design. <laughs> yes, right. The most important. So, but here's what, let me use that as an example. But I want to pick up on, on what Laura said. And, and, and Depayan, because <clears throat> the way in which the companies will come in and address that is represented by this vase of flowers, okay? And they'll come in and they'll say, um, it's the sunflower. I want you to really focus on this sunflower. <laughs> it's all about, uh, and I've got a solution. I'll help you solve this problem, and it's the sunflower, and then you can declare that you've done something because of a lack of understanding. Not, not, there's, no, there's no malice. There's no ma bad intent or anything, but a lack, of, as Laura points out, of understanding. And so what we have to come up with is a set of rules, or it, it, is, a, is a way of thinking about policy that is agile enough to deal with the problems that Susan identified, which is the smart lawyers don't get paid what they get paid for not being able to figure out ways around fixed sets of rules. Mm -hmm. And so you need behavioral conditions where you say, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna, it's, I, I like it to the referee on the field who throws the flag and makes the call. And, and that's not the way policymakers think. And the companies hate that because they say, oh, that's uncertainty. I don't, yeah. I don't know what the rules are which is really code for, I'd rather have something really prescriptive and specific so that my smart folks can figure out how to get around it. L Laura, how, how, what's a, what does a policymaker do? I mean, it seems like a bewildering kind of waterfront of issues and uh, a surfeit of expertise. Where does, that, where does that leave our beloved government? So, I mean, I, I was actually going to follow up with what you just said. You said, we, we need to figure out a new way to be dealing with this, to, to figure out either what the, the right regulation is or how to deal with this lack of transparency. Who's we? Because I think that's, that's the part of the problem. And I think if we, we sit here at Harvard and we can talk about it all day, or if uh, we have uh, people in a member's office talking about it, it's <coughs> that's part of the problem. So I think we need to meaningfully engage the companies also. I'm not sure the exact right way to do that, but I, I sort of push back on the assumption that every single person in a tech company is just trying to find a way around being ethical. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that, is that these are, it is not that these are bad people, okay? It's just that they are presented with the ability 
to make their own rules and they have the economic incentive and the technological ability to make those rules in their interest rather than your and my interest. Mm -hmm. And nobody has repealed the law of human nature. Right. And Susan opened with his view of them not just creating their own rules, but creating kind of like wholly independent right. systems. Yeah, that's right. Right? Yeah. Um, I want to just uh, go, <clears throat> go back a little bit here and think about, you know, I feel like in part we don't have good language even to talk about what's happening here. You know, I noticed each of you kind of approached it differently. <laughs> uh, Depion said there's an industry, right? Uh, Laura, you talked about like science broadly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, what, it's, it's like one of the challenges here, how do we get a handle on this? What are we talking about? And is it different from, from anything that's come before? I mean, Tom, I know in your book, you, have a, you kind of draw like a historical thread here on communications technology, right. but, but it, does, it does, as reluctant as I am to believe like Silicon Valley propaganda that this is radically different, it feels like something might be kind of different. So every network-based technology revolution has been different. You know, so, so, so when the railroad and the telegraph brought in the industrial revolution, society looked around and said, well, wait a minute, the rules that have governed us to this point have, have governed an, an agrarian mercantilist society and economy don't work anymore because it is radically different. What are we going to do about that? So we got antitrust laws. Well, we got we corporations got, first. We got right. corporations first. <laughs> then we got antitrust laws. Then we got uh, consumer protection laws. Then we got worker protection laws. And we got the structure of the, the, the administrative state that has brought us to this point where we look again and say, oh my God, that's not a sufficient structure for dealing with the new challenges created by the digital revolution, and how do we come to grips with those? But, but Susan, if I understand you, <clears throat> you think that part of the challenge is not just new regulatory structures, but actually building a different kind of infrastructure. Well, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that these companies are able to get around our existing lousy infrastructure and build their own world, essentially, by putting their data centers very close to us, by avoiding healthcare, by avoiding transit. And I just want us every once in a while to think about these big structural issues, and I wanted to use this occasion to do it. I also disagree mildly with Tom. I think each one of these services is like its own railroad system, where it's both transporting and choosing what's on the cars and locking up territory. It's like a railroad system characterized by network effects and extremely high switching costs in the language of mm. economists. So and that's, what, that's part of the new so that we, has to be dealt with. Well, but we do know how to do with, deal with this, and it is by divestiture, not by behavioral conditions and not by vague rules they can work around, and it is by increasing competition it, for these various uh, network systems, you know, and not forcing them with words to share their facilities, because we've learned that doesn't work. We've learned it over and over again. So I'm looking for clarity. The companies would be too. Um, and the only thing I can think about for privacy would be to have a blue ribbon panel, ombuds function, essentially, within each major company, capable of asking all the hard questions about how data is being used and where it's being sent and what's happening, and then producing reports regularly to the public. Because no Google regulator, today. no legislator is going to be able to do that. And um, the PCLOB we use for right. privacy and civil liberties for uh, national surveillance issues has done an excellent job on that basis. And I, that is a corporate solution that I can imagine would work. But we have that today. Google says, don't worry. But it's not put in place by the government. That's the difference. So you have, you, have a, you have government oversight of an internal corporate activity yep. that has to justify their decisions to some governmental authority. No, I mean, they, they're put in place there, but they were issue reports. Who watches the watchman? Well, the, they can be... Well, you, we could have like an audit-like yeah. system. Well, but so otherwise, I mean, it's very hard to keep track of all this. But I, I think Tom, what Tom suggests here is uh, to an extent true. I mean, <coughs> for example, Facebook 
Google, Snapchat, they're all under these consent orders That's with the Federal right. Trade Commission, which require them to essentially report to the, uh, to the commission exactly what kinds of product innovations they're making every month mm -hmm. and report that to the commission. Um, and, and all of that activity, all that practice gets audited by mm -hmm. PwC or by some, some outside consulting firm. And of course, PwC didn't catch Cambridge Analytica. Right, so what I'm suggesting is something that probably sounds too intrusive, but having an internal function <coughs> that has wide range to f ask questions about what's going on and then issue reports to the public that are not detailed about the trade secrets of the company, but that we can trust as to whether people's privacy is being abused. That's what I'm suggesting. And more of an ombuds function than the so constant one of the oversight things of the that One of the things that we suggested here last year mm -hmm. was that there be public interest APIs. So what happens is there is data that comes into the algorithm mm -hmm. and there's data that goes out. We don't need to know what's happening in the algorithm. But there ought to be the ability to have an API that looks at the data coming in and looks at the data coming out and mm -hmm. can understand patterns of usage and what is going on. We do that today every time we pick up the newspaper. Yeah. We can see the editorial function. We can make determinations as to whether it's truthful, which way it's leading politically, et cetera. We, can, we, we don't need a, an internal audit function. You can do this with opening things up so that different groups can have their own algorithms that go in and ask their own questions and make their own decisions. I, uh, I, oh, sorry. Give me one minute, yeah. pause, and we'll keep this discussion going. But I want to open it up to questions from the audience. We have four microphones, two on the floor here, two up there. Please uh, come to the microphone with your questions. Uh, I will, as we're waiting for people with their copious and piercing uh, questions, I'm going <laughs> to, Dupin, you had something? Uh, I just wanted to say that I, I do agree, Susan, that if if the auditing function were just better and more transparent and done more effectively by the right. companies, which they're currently not incentivized to do. But if we incentivized it, maybe with stricter government oversight, that could be a solution. I also wanted to just revisit what you were saying earlier, which is where do we even start? What industry are we even talking about? And I would define it, I mean, just getting a little bit more tactical than uh, what you were both eloquently describing at a higher level. Uh, I would describe it as the internet sector. When we think about, for example, digital advertising, there's a digital advertising universe. It's, it, at the center of it is Facebook, Google, Amazon, and uh, some other tech companies, including Verizon. Um, but uh, ancillary to it uh, is the data brokers and the retailers and all these industries that essentially hoover up data, feed it into the digital advertising ecosystem. A and by the way, also advertisers that, that of course, channel money uh, for marketing reasons into the sector. So uh, I would define it broadly uh, as including certainly the core business of companies like Facebook and Amazon, but also the uh, technolo uh, technolo uh, internet functions of companies like Walmart and companies like Audi or Mercedes, because if we think about it, if we walk into a Mercedes dealership or an Audi dealership right now um, in, in Boston, what will happen is that uh, the car dealership will know that you're coming in using your phone, using uh, Wi-Fi tracking, using uh, GPS tracking. Uh, it will, uh, of course, sign you up on an email uh, or, or many customers up on an email so that they, they know that you've walked into the dealership and it'll sell that information uh, to one of the four big data brokers in the United States. And in particular, Oracle is the biggest one that partners with car dealerships. Then that information moves into the internet sector, into the digital advertising sector, because companies like Twitter and Google and, and, uh, and, and Facebook enable <coughs> you to essentially pipe in data broker data and, ad and target ads against that. So I would define it broadly, which is why I would suggest that these privacy regulations or competition regulations or transparency regulations are not focused just on big tech, but certainly center on big tech, but also apply to the general practice of collecting information. 
and to the general uh, need to uh, uh, promote competition across the U.S. industry. I want to open up. We have a number of folks lined up for questions. I have three rules about questions. One, introduce yourself. Two, keep it brief so we can get to everybody's questions. And three, it must be a question, question mark. <laughs> Please, here, introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Noah Sleeper. I work in information management. Um, so I'm curious, you know, you've talked about these hordes of data that these companies have collected and sort of stored for their own uses. And just in terms of long-term retention, I mean, if I'm a computational historian 30, 40 years in the future, is there a way for um, this data to be used in an academic sense, or is it all sort of internal and uh, not really open to the public? Well, barring a change in our existing legal structures, there would be no access to anybody outside the company. But that's changing more recently. There are lots of data collaboratives where the private sector is starting to share information more openly uh, in machine-readable ways. Um, and it's coming a lot from this open data movement because the government has been very proactive in making their information available. So they're starting to work out relationships and agreements with telcos in particular and sharing back the relevant information. A good example of this is Uber. Uber and, the, and Lyft in New York City, they started sharing information to improve congestion, traffic congestion with the city of, of New York. Well, right, they have to because that's a legal requirement. Right. <laughs> but let, let, me tell you story. let me tell you a story that's in the book, okay? Uh, I love Michael Conley novels. Um, I, uh, uh, while I was chairman, I was lucky enough to go out to the set of the movie Bosch or the, the TV show Bosch. Uh, to meet with, with Conley and his writers and the guy from Amazon who was responsible for the show. They gave a very long story short. We get, the, day, the afternoon drags on and I say, we were talking about data and the role of data in this business. I say, so, so you guys know, looking at the Amazon guy, you know when I get up to go to the bathroom, don't you? And he says, yeah, because you push pause. And I turned to the writers and I said, isn't that a valuable data point for you? Because you know when the plot has lagged. And if you knew that, you could do something to address that. Oh my God, World War III erupted there with the writers saying, we've been asking for that information and they won't give it to us. And the guy from Amazon saying, that's my information. And, um, and, and I think that's the problem that we face right now. And the question is, how do, we, how do we bring to data the concept of openness that we're trying to bring to the networks? Uh, hi, my name is Harut Manugian. I'm a MPA student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, my question is, uh, when we talk about regulation of this sector, you know, there are other countries that have a lot of regulation, China, Turkey, North Korea. How do we <laughs> put like Just the to guidelines? name some real great examples. <laughs> How do we like set the guidelines on the regulators? Because if, if tech companies are gonna make rules in their own personal interest, how do we make sure you know, political actors aren't making the rules on them in their own personal interest? Well, that's why it's so important that each one of you becomes a leader in this sector and is responsible for public policy. The public policy has a beating ethical heart and adheres to the American values that Tom is talking about. That, I think that's our core mission, actually, as educators in this area. Anybody else? She's right, right here. Hi, my name is Amisha Kambeth, and I'm a freshman at the college. My question relates to the relationship between um, the rise in machine learning in AI and specifically privacy concerns. I'm sure all of us here have been aware of the recent spotlight that's been going on about the vast and incredible implications and potential of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And at the same time, there's been a lot of publicity, especially through like politicians talking about concerns over privacy of consumer data. So my question specifically is how should policymakers navigate that dichotomy between wanting to encourage these companies and not impede the development of such technologies, but at the same time protect the privacy and the data of consumers when that data specifically is so pivotal for the development of those technologies? That's a great question. Yep. Great question. And I think you've got to go back to overriding principles. And, 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 and it is not 
Uh, it is not a whole series of hard and, hard and fast rules. It is, it is draw the four corners of, uh, of, of what your expectations are, um, and then to have the flexibility to assess new developments and to determine whether or not they meet the concepts within those four corners. And um, because you don't want to have a situation where the regulation is so strict as it inhibits innovation. And at the same point in time, you don't want to have the results of no oversight at all. So it just seems to me that you have to have a general just, conduct. If there's no oversight at all, what happens? Everything you can imagine. Right. Who makes, I mean, you know, this yeah. the, back to the question of who makes the rules. But I, th I think we need to talk about what privacy means. So I know Pew Research did a recent study that was trying to understand when people talk about privacy, what does that mean to them? And they say, well, it's creepy. I, I feel like what, whatever's happening to me is creepy. And then you dig in another layer down and it's, well, I don't want my identity to be stolen and I don't want to be targeted with specific ads. But how many of those people actually went through and read the new terms and conditions when they got a notice from GDPR? None of So I, I think in order for policymakers to meaningfully engage and create policies that effectively react to the privacy concerns, we need to have a better sense of what that actually means. But the, mm -hmm. but the, but the problem with reading the terms and conditions, if you were to read Amazon's terms and conditions yep. out loud, it <laughs> would take you nine hours. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. There but, you know. are plenty of flaws with GDPR, and part of that is the language. And, and so, we, so, so it's, it, is, it is less a, here's the black, my God, you're going to do this. And more, here is what, you, ha what I, you are expected with enforcement tools to manage, to deliver this kind of a protection to the people whose information you have hoovered up. I just, I also want to just briefly say I really, really appreciate the question and I think uh, just, I, I think both Laura and Tom are spot on. Uh, another way to express what they're suggesting is that, uh, and there's a, there's a, broad, uh, there's a uh, really broad discussion amongst AI researchers and technologists on this very question right now. Um, and I think, I think another, another way to express it is by uh, thinking about serving the end user and framing your technology uh, from, a, from a human centered perspective. Uh, that's, that's one of the themes that's coming out of those discussions in academia right now. That is to say, uh, how can we take the principles that Tom is talking about and think about the end consumer, the, the person using Google or the person um, who is at the end of the uh, credit worthiness decision by some credit agency um, and that, that's driven by artificial intelligence. And how can we design these technologies in ways that promote their interests? And thinking about their interests, how can we, how can we craft, how can we push those into whatever regulation or policy regime we want to apply uh, to AI as, as we go forward? This would be the perfect time to plug ai.shorensteincenter.org. Mm -hmm where Depine and I have uh, edited 18 essays from policymakers and computer science uh, academics from around the country on exactly those questions, ai.shorenseincenter.org. We'll go here next. Introduce yourself, ask a question. Keep it brief. Hi, thanks. Hi, my name is David Klein. I'm a business school student at Harvard and formerly a tech worker, a uh, self-interested tech worker. Uh, my, first of all, I want to say thank you for working on the technology and public project, purpose project. I actually think it's amazing that you're educating uh, government officials before regulating. Uh, my question is about what I, what I heard tonight, that there's a desire to regulate without having understanding. Like, we obviously know that uh, con Congress people were asking, how does Facebook work? Uh, to me, that is not meeting the bar of credibility to be worthy of saying, I can step in and regulate this. So what is the onus on government to be smart enough to earn the right to regulate. Or, all the older or. people need to leave, and all the younger <laughs> yeah. people need to show That's up. It's a real question. I mean, you know, it's a real question, yeah. and, and it is a real problem. But I, I do think that you'll see a wave of retirements from a lot of levels of government <clears throat> over the next few years, and I'm hoping 
that students who really care about these issues will show up and serve in huge numbers. It's a generational issue at this point, and even having the visceral sense of how these things work is absent in a lot of our elected officials. But we also have to lower the barrier to running for office, too, and make it more approachable for people with a technology background. And? And? Um, not in any way disagreeing with what you said, Susan. Uh, and Congress needs to exercise its power to ask questions to become informed. Gene Kimmelman was talking earlier today with Laura, as a matter of fact, in a meeting we had, about the 14 hearings, or was it 15, Gene? 15 hearings that the House Telecom Subcommittee had before they got around to drafting a piece of legislation. Hearing from everybody, getting educated, coming up to speed, spending a couple hours with Mark Zuckerberg is not an educational experience. It takes, uh, that, that didn't come out right, but. Uh, yeah, uh, but, <laughs> not as sufficient. But, but it's sufficient. Right. But, but, um, but to have that kind of an, an in-depth, and until recently, the Congress has abdicated that responsibility. That, and the, that, the, that the, the, learning, the, the learning process of the Congress has atrophied over the last decade. Correct, oh, and we now have a situation where as the Democrats take control of the House, now that they have taken control of the House, they have been saying, we are going to have these kinds of educational hearings to bring everybody up to speed and to have a full exposure to all the ideas so that we can come to grips with these issues. And that is a watershed moment in the way Congress has acted for the last decade. So I, I think that's a really good question. And I mean, members of Congress in particular are the ultimate generalists. They have to be able to make policy on healthcare and education and housing and all of these different things. So yes, we're all working on tech. Why is it all of a sudden we, we feel like tech is the most important thing? And I think one of my colleagues at Digital HKS said, you know, I wish my, my member of Congress cared more about human rights. And I, but my pushback would be that tech is a, a foundational enabler of all of these areas. And it's really important to have capacity on your staff to be able to know if you need to learn more and engage and write, ask a, those correct questions. So um, it's, a, it's a really tough thing, and that's one of the things that we're working on for the TAP project. But even knowing that you need to know yeah. is a huge issue. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Bob Rosenfeld. I wish I were a freshman in the college, but unfortunately, I'm an antitrust lawyer and represented one of those big behemoths that you described for over 20 years. 25 years ago, people were sitting in a room like this saying, oh, woe is me. Microsoft controls the operating system. They control the browsers. They control the internet. The game is over. And people sat on the stage and they said, it's too complicated, we can't regulate it. And you know what happened? The Department of Justice brought a lawsuit against Microsoft. The EU brought lots of litigation against Microsoft. And the world changed. In effect, that duty to deal, Tom, that you talked about became open APIs and requirements to do it. You couldn't link the browser to your operating system. You had to have competition in those markets. And everybody, from the Microsoft lawyers to their competitors, would say that changed the game. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to educate Congress, which I think is fantasy land. You had economists from the Harvard Business School and the Kennedy School who knew about network industries and economies of scale very well, and Microsoft had their experts, and in the process, they came up with remedies. And the last point I'd make is one of those remedies was not regulation. Because yes, smart lawyers do get paid a lot to get around rules, but it is in the nature of rules that you get around them. The way to regulate the tech industry is competition. If you had four Facebooks or three Microsofts, they might compete over privacy. They might compete over access to the web. They might compete over what they do to your data. So to wrap this sermon into a, or screed more appropriately, into a question, why did the Bush administration 
and the Obama administration do nothing by way of antitrust litigation to deal with these behemoths. You don't need new tools. You don't need new regulation. The world is more complicated than we are smart. You ought to use what we've already got. Why didn't you? That is an excellent question. <laughs> well, and fools, I'm on your side. And fools rush in. Um, so how is your competition between, um, between Snapchat um, and Instagram working uh, to solve your privacy problems? They, it's not. Right. It's not. They were okay. bought. So competition isn't the solution to everything. I'm, and I, am, I stand at the front of the line in competition. One, two. How long did the, uh, did the Microsoft antitrust case take? Ten years. Okay. Nine. Nine. <laughs> And was appealed. Mm. Uh, right. Yeah. So, right, but, but so, the, so the value, there's, so, so nobody is, a, you know, God bless the antitrust laws and they need to be enforced. Okay. Unfortunately, they have been significantly weakened by the consumer welfare test, but we won't go there and that's, and There's this a paper on the Shorenstein Center website on that subject by yep. Phil Verveer. And, yep. this, and, this, and this Supreme Court, which is the body that makes the antitrust laws in this country, okay, uh, currently seems to be skewed towards the consumer welfare test instead of the you know, classic, what's the, what's the impact on the market? And so even if you got there with this complaint. Several things. One, the pendency of the Microsoft suit in and of itself made Microsoft behave differently. Check, that's good, okay? There's an argument, as you know, that Google may not even have existed unless Microsoft had not, oh my God, they're looking at us and how do we behave well? So, so this, is, this is good. The difficulty is the length of time it takes to move through the process, number one. Number two, whether or not the consumer welfare test that the Supremes will ultimately uh, impose uh, can, can be beneficial, but, it is a tool that should not be ignored. Now, how do we take the ideas, the pro-competition ideas, and put them into other structures so that you drive that competition, not just through antitrust, but also through policies that say, for instance, um, there should be uh, competition in terms of the delivery of your broadband services. And how do you facilitate that through a regulatory environment? Because you will not get there. Three quarters of the American people have between zero and one choice as to who their high-speed broadband provider is. Antitrust is not gonna solve that problem. So I'm, I, I agree with the points you made. And they are, they are one very important arrow in the quiver, but we can't ignore the other arrows as well. But what, why, didn't, why didn't the Bush and Obama, Obama administration pursue that as a significant arrow in the quiver? Uh, can I just, just yeah. interject and, <coughs> and responding directly to that? Uh, if we are talking s strictly about big tech, that is to say the, you know, the internet companies that we're talking about and application of antitrust regulations against that industry, uh, I think, I mean, it was just, it was totally new in the Bush administration and these companies were, were just a few years old. And I would, I would suggest that was probably the case. It, the, this is industry was just too new uh, during the first term of the Obama administration as well. And only after November 2016 did we really get a clear picture of how a lack of competition in that sector uh, is really implicating the American consumer in, in really nefarious ways. So I would say that about big tech. Now you could make the argument that we should have applied antitrust rules to other industries which too have become tremendously concentrated over the past, uh, past 25 years. Uh, and I, don't, I wouldn't have anything to say about that. I think, well, the only thing to suggest there is that, uh, I mean, the courts and the developing jurisprudence on, on antitrust has, over time, pushed us in a particular direction. And it, it, ha it would take a tremendous amount of political will to reverse that. But I think the mounting public sentiment that we do 
uh, reverse that is, is, uh, is, you know, really piling up this year, last year, uh, and, and we could see the, the winds change uh, uh, very soon. Hi, um, thank you guys for coming. My name is Debo. I'm from the School of Education, so I would, I think, bring this down to earth a little bit. Um, so it's about big tech and democracy. We've spoken a lot about big tech. We've spoken, I think my definition of democracy is governed by the people for the people. We've spoken a lot about um, the for the people. So my question is about um, the public, the people that this whole discussion is about. Do you think the public have any role to play in this discussion? Like, and also, if they have a role, do they have the power to you know, play in this so situation? Well, I'm sort of an institutionalist, so I think the public has a role in electing representatives and making sure that people are in the administrative agencies who can cope with these problems. I think exercising sort of direct democratic control is done by marching away from services that you don't want to use and, you know, things like boycotts of unpopular practices. But these are private companies with their terms of service that are going to operate uh, like as if they were game gods, as if they we're all in their virtual world and they, they set the rules. And the only, you have exit, voice, loyalty. I think exit is a pretty powerful thing. Voice can be powerful, but as these things are slightly addictive, people may yell and then rejoin. Uh, so I'm, I'm all for getting people in positions of power that can act decisively and clearly with all of these tools, uh, regulation, antitrust, whatever works, and uh, the flowering of competition of new services that have uh, ways of behaving that you like. But here's a problem. People may say they care about privacy in public fora, but they don't act that way when they're out on the internet. You know, people will give away everything for a chocolate bar. So <laughs> or I, less. Or less. So it's not clear to me that uh, people's best interests are necessarily deeply embedded in their minds um, unless they get the whole consequences, which aren't actually visible to any normal human. You can't actually see what's happening. Hi, um, my name is Alicia. I'm a junior at the college studying computer science. And my question is that for those of us who are planning to become software engineers and those of us who care about democracy and ethics, what can we do as software engineers to try to change the tech industry? You can run for office. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not so, joking. I'm not joking either. Yeah, actually. Um, there are also lots of fantastic fellowships where you can actually go in and make a difference and start adding that, that technical expertise and that voice to ask the right questions in those offices or for those members. So I think Tech Congress is a good opportunity. US Digital Services is a great uh, organization, 18F. There's the Defense Digital Services. There are so many different ways that you can channel your expertise into ways of improving democratic society. I would encourage anyone that's in computer science to go that route. And there's this world of think tanks that needs your expertise yeah. on all parts of the political spectrum yeah. and often doesn't have it. So there are lots of ways. So talk to us. About I think well, after the panel, one of them will tell you, help you get an internship. Yeah, that's, that's what I let think. Me, let, that's me, let me approach it a slightly different way though, okay? Yeah. When you are, if you go to work for one of these companies, for instance, you have every right, in fact, and responsibility when you're told to do something, you say, why? Yeah. The reality that is that it is so, as you know, it is so much fun to build something and to get the damn thing to work that you never really consider what the consequences yeah. are. And what has been missing has been that kind of an ethical construct that everybody can be involved in to say, why? Is this the right thing? We are running out of time. We'll take three more questions. One, two, three, and then we're done. Please, go ahead. Um, my name is uh, Hương Nguyễn, and I'm from Vietnam. So I really appreciate that I had the chance to attend your uh, debate for today. And I think that I learned a lot from all of your sharing. I came to the Boston as the independent volunteer focusing on the student at risk. I used to be the PhD candidate in Texas for three years, focusing on higher education in America. And thanks God and thanks America once again that you teach me very well about how 
to behave like the human and how to enjoy the freedom and how to defy the democracy. So that is the reason which is I really interest to raise up not just for me, but for all of you and also of the panel here and the people in this room and all of the America to think about that. Big tech and democracy, that is a fiction we try to mislead us. Because we must fight to the true facts. The same line, one of the uh, very respectful guys here shared that they have their own interests and we have our own interest. So maybe we think that is an interest it in different ways only. Let me tell you one thing just from the Vietnam experience and also for the American experience about the technology and democracy. So, Ma'am, ma we I got we got other people. What's the question you want to ask the panel? The question I ask that is that is a fiction or so not. And the reason I want to try to explain clearly here that Technology is most of the biggest technology they work for money. Democracy, that is work for people. So that is a fiction we try to mislead the people. Let me tell you, internet, one of the technology that is developed in America, in China, and the biggest country, the richest countries. But how we can help Americans out of the poverty? how we can help to protect our people database and the same thing for the vietnam so the, that is my questions so thank you so the incentive of the big companies is towards profit that's what drives it and yet they have a disproportionate impact on democracy and on public policy right no doubt this is part of what you were driving at I yeah think, absolutely Susan. and they can create their own systems and they're extremely powerful in keeping the status quo in place they're very powerful at keeping the status quo in place why, yes, they are. Here, sir, yes. Hi, my name is Max. I'm actually a Northeastern student studying math and computer science. And my question has to do with the fact that competition and policies to promote competition are helpful, but fragmented user bases that might arise from competitive social media platforms are inconvenient to those users. Yeah. So how can we design policies that address the fact that users have an incentive structurally to centralize their usage of social media platforms? Well, this is an old question in network industries, and the idea is that you have a portability <coughs> mandate of some kind, or in interconnection mandate, that you can take your data with you and your connections and go somewhere else. These are very hard to enforce and put in place, but that is the answer, to make, make it make this lower the cost of switching from one of these networks to another. For these social networks, you have to bring all your friends, too. That's the challenge, and that's why it's very hard to exit. But let's not forget the open standard of email, you can, right? I mean, right. email is an example of it go. working. It can work, but this was built not to have doors around it. So it's, we would have to retrofit doors into existing networks. Do we run the risk, then, of having social media platforms, um, if, for example, there are six of them, with compatibility band-aids for me to move my data between them, do I have to make six parallel posts to get information <laughs> to all my friends? That would be inconvenient. Mm -hmm. You but get to have many parts of your personality. <laughs> but actually you don't right now. There are yeah. third party providers that help you that aggregate across the different platforms, right? Like Hootsuite and... Yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's an additional thing here that if, if you are... Uh, so I think implicit to, to what Susan uh, said is that we're, we're not necessarily suggesting that we need to break up Facebook into its constituent parts, Instagram, WhatsApp, because of exactly what you're saying, or, that is, or, or even break up Facebook into 10 different Facebooks, because again, that, that would, that would uh, get to straight to the problem that you're talking about. But with the duty to deal and the data portability that Tom and Susan are suggesting, what you <coughs> could have is, is an ability to take not just the information that you've uploaded to Facebook and that the, the likes that you've put on Facebook, but also the implicit, the, the inferences that Facebook has developed about you. Uh, that is to say, your behavioral advertising profile that is invisible to anybody who use it, who's a user of Facebook, but which Facebook has, or Google has, or Twitter has, or Verizon has to target ads at you, to, to actually make that transparent and make that transferable to other service providers. 
And that is the thing that, that is most valuable to these companies out of, out of any intellectual property that they have. And if other competitors now had access to it, so if Snapchat now had access to it, that immediately shuts off or that, that immediately blunts Facebook's uh, uh, lock-in. Lock mm -hmm. right. Last question. Thank you. So I'm Amy Robinson. I'm an MPP student. I'm also a member of the TAP team, and I used to be part of the school's health and libraries broadband coalition. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, so I keep hearing about the balkanization of the internet and that we have European internet, Chinese internet. So I'm wondering how we can make uh, the American regulatory regime compatible with all these other internets that are developing, or if we're just if it's inevitable to see these national borders mapped on to the cyber world. Wow. Well, <laughs> big last question. <laughs> well, OK. Sovereigns have tanks and guns. That allows them to set up filters at their borders. And there's nothing that the United States can do about that. But the TCPIP protocol, this whole idea of having any computer speak to another, is actually an engine of democracy and was Forced it, uh, foisted on the rest of the world by the United States, frankly. We walked around to all the other nations saying, this will be great. And France had to abandon it, Minitel, and all kinds of things happened. So <laughs> that, They're that, still pissed about right. It. The problem is that the sovereigns still have the tanks and guns. And so they can draw uh, lines around their borders. And the Belt Road Initiative of China allows them to touch 65% of the world's population and many ports, and it's all going to be exclusive Chinese gear. So. What we have to be is the city on a hill that is so attractive, people want to deal with us, and we have more people coming into our idea of an open internet than who want to be locked into that other vision of the internet. But this is a titanic battle that is just beginning now. And it is um, expanded, it is uh, uh, exacerbated by the fact that we have failed to step up and make rules for ourselves. That's very true. Historically, the United States would establish a policy and then go to the rest of the world and say, let's all make sure we're in sync together. Mm -hmm. So after two weeks after we passed the open internet rule in 2015, I was in London sitting down with all of the regulators from the EU, helping them write their open internet rules so that we would all be consistent. The fact that we have abrogated our responsibility to deal with these issues mm -hmm. has left the world adrift and created new regulatory superpowers, particularly the EU and China. Mm -hmm. And just, just because we sat on our hands and said, oh, we don't want to do anything. There are consequences. Okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna bow to pressure because she's holding Susan's book. Oh, gosh. oh, oh wow. gosh. And allow Thank one you. more question. This is embarrassing, but okay. what is the question? I just want to <laughs> sort of raise this up a little bit. My name is Marcy Murningham. I've been around Harvard for 44 years and have worked in the area of fiduciary capitalism and social justice. And I just want to say and taught courses at Harvard Divinity School on money, media, and morality. I think this whole discussion is about what you're talking about, Mr. Wheeler, is fiduciary duty. Mm -hmm. And what Susan is talking about is uh, social justice. So it seems to me that the framework of social justice and the framework of fiduciary duty affects the money power as well as the laws and regulations and what have you that apply to corporations mm -hmm. and financial managers. So when you start identifying those key performance indicators or principles, I think you will find that there's a whole world of other folks working on principles for financial management, principles for political leadership, and that the, these, all, these all dovetail together. Great. Okay, great. That's thank similar you, to the earlier question from uh, the Vietnamese American woman. Uh, I want to thank everyone. There are many people who are lined up to ask a question who did not get to, and I apologize. Um, I want to thank the staff for letting us run over who have to stay late and help put, put things away. And I especially want to thank our panelists for giving <laughs> hey. us their time and attention. Thank you. All right. <laughs>